Welcome to Winter Storytelling, everybody. Um, my name is Molly Stockdale. I'm the Executive Director of Traveler's Rest Connection, and we're the friends group here, the nonprofit partner of Traveler's Rest State Park. And we're so happy to be hosting this today. I want to begin today's program by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the homeland of the Salish Kellis Bay people at a place they named Timsumkli. Their example as the original stewards of this land guides our work today. Traveler's Rest Connection is committed to respectfully sharing the history and contemporary culture of the indigenous people who lived and traveled through the ancient crossroads on this land. We learn from many indigenous artists, elders, and organizations. We invite you to learn from and support them as well. I want to say a quick thank you to everyone who makes these programs possible. Uh, first and foremost, the members of Traveler's Rest Connection. Thank you for your generous support. Much gratitude to MCAT, Missoula's Community Media Resource, who provided a media assistance grant to record all of our winter storytelling programs. And a thanks to Montana Public Radio for their reciprocal sponsorship with The Connection that helps us to spread the word about this and other programs. I'm gonna shout out right now to the folks who are joining us on Zoom. It is helpful if you keep yourself muted and your video off during the presentation but if you have questions for our speaker, please type them into the chat box on Zoom. Galen is monitoring the chat for questions and for any technical difficulties you might have. Thanks, Galen. Um, I'd like to take just a moment and ask the folks in the room and on Zoom if you know how to use your applause button reaction um, to help me say thank you to a friend who is going to not be with us for too much longer, Clay Vernon has been our interim park ranger, or recreation ranger. Um, he's been here for several months now, well, uh, after our recreation ranger left, and our park manager, uh, Ben, has been away on uh, paternal leave, parental leave. Um, he's been such a joy to work with, and he keeps the microphone working, so we like him for that. Um, and I just wanted to give this to you. Um, and I'm sure that Deborah will sign something nice in it at the end of the program. Cool. So thank you, buddy. Thanks a lot. Oh, and to introduce our speaker today, Deborah Magpie Erling is the author of Perma Red and the Lost Journals of Sacagawea. An early version of the Lost Journals, written in verse, was produced as an artist book during the bicentennial of the Lewis and Clark expedition. She has contributed, contributed to many magazines and anthologies, including Lewis and Clark Through Indian Eyes. Deborah has received both a National Endowment for the Arts grant and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She retired from the University of Montana, where she was named Professor Emeritus in 2021. She is Bitterroot Salish. Deborah. Good morning. What a beautiful day today. Did you, like the sun is so nice and um, I love this community. I see Steve Glukert here, my God. Um, I love this community um, and how, how you all gather uh, in curiosity about history, um, to listen to storytelling and you know, to gather together you know, as united people. And I, I love that through um, you know, through our curiosity and through our love for our community, I think we can do great things and have done great things in Montana. And I would like to um, acknowledge Diane Sand, who is here, um, who represents our community so well and uh, does, the, does such good work, um, you know, at our legislature. So thank you. Can we hear a round of applause for the good work she does? Um, I brought something special with me today. Um, Peter Koch, uh, if you are unfamiliar with Peter Koch, uh, he is a master printer, and he is like the premier printer of uh, the world, not just um, the United States. Uh, but for some reason, he took a real liking to um, this piece that I had at MAM during the bicentennial, and it was the Lost Journals of Sacagawea. And Steve Glukert was actually responsible for 
for that because apparently there had been <laughs> there had been somebody right who um, was supposed to write uh, kind of in response or the um, in respons response to these native authors, or not authors, artists, and their work for the bicentennial and how they were responding. And they pulled, the, the person pulled out. Or, and so Laura Millen and Steve Gluckert asked me if I would, if I would write. And I said, oh no, I'm, I'm done with Lewis and Clark because I'd, I'd already written, uh, like, I think it was a 5,000 um, word story for Alvin Giuseppe, the, the late great Alvin Giuseppe, who is the premier scholar of the Nez Perce. Um, and he had asked me to write this. And then when they asked me to respond to these artists, I thought, I, I don't know anything really about art. I appreciate it. I admire it. But I can't write in any, with any intelligence about it. Um, wonderful, marvelous, <laughs> like that's about it. And then he said, um, no, you can write anything you want. And the curious thing is I sat down in a coffee shop in Spokane and not even 30 minutes later, I had written uh, the manuscript, The Lost Journals of Sacagawea. It was the, the book that became the museum piece book. Um, Peter had asked me to write a few more pieces, and um, and it became the book. And he just sent me this is kind of a, this magnificent. He's his artwork is so beautiful, but in this is um, another. Uh, it's a fragment from uh, the Lost Journals, the novel. So he. He asked me to um, submit some work to him, and, and he and Susan Filter, um, his wife, uh, put this together. And it is, it's just stunning. If you look at this piece here, if you can see it, I don't know how well it shows up on camera, um, but it's actually the pigment from this, the dust from uh, Venetian buildings that they were in Venice and working on, so it, this red, dark pigment you know, so there's so much history, you know, just in the book itself and the beautiful work they did. So you're welcome to come up and look at this afterwards. Um, today I thought I would, um, I'd read a piece. Uh, when Alba Giuseppe had asked me to, to write something about Lewis and Clark, we we're kind of limited about what we could write. It was, you know, I was just supposed to write about um, the Salish and, uh, you know, everyone was, everyone, every native person in this book, um, Lewis and Clark through Indian Eyes, were asked to, to respond. Uh, and, you know, it, it's funny, the things that happen in your life, um, and now as I get older, I see that, like, a lot of things are, you know, I, I never would have written about Lewis and Clark, and I never would have written about Sacagawea. That was not even in my, in my periphery. It wasn't... There was nothing in my life that suggested I would write these things and be drawn to this story. And I always find it amazing that somehow we, we don't have a choice sometimes um, as artists or writers. Um, the th things come to us, things are placed in our path. Um, and this, this story in particular, I wanted to start out in, I'll, I realized that there's so, so, so much community here, so many people here that I'd like to have a conversation with you. But I wanted to read a piece from um, Lewis and Clark through Indian Eyes. It's called What We See. And uh, it was kind of a, this remarkable journey. And I'm not even sure how, I don't even know how they got my name to, to go on this raft trip. But there was, um, I made a list of some of the people that I remember. There was Sandra Alcazer and her husband, Philip, Ted Waddell, um, Stephen Gluckert, um, Susan Stewart. And these, um, I'd say, <laughs> these men would, uh, like the description is, our river guides were our, our core. Um, with ceaseless grim smiles, they, they, they humped our belongings into and out of swollen rubber rafts. And so we were asked to travel the banks of, we were asked to travel the Missouri River, to float the Missouri River from Fort Benton to Judith Landing. And so it was um, to somehow get the sense of what it was like um, 
what uh, Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea and York and, and uh, those 32 men had experienced. Um, and I have this, the last day of our journey, Susan Stewart and I began to talk about Lewis and Clark. We spoke mostly about Meriwether Lewis. I was struck by the irony of his name and the circumstances of his life and death. I was not fascinated with his life as much I was as, as much as I was interested in the mystery of his death. Whether he was murdered or took his whether he was murdered or took his own life. I remembered his reflections on his thir 31st year. I reflected that I had done very little, very little indeed, to further the happiness of the human race or to advance information for succeeding generations. So he was aware, he was like acutely aware of, of his position and, and what he was bringing, I believe. I thought about Lewis, a long journey through the wilderness, the beauty and terror of his trip. He could not have passed over this land and not have wondered about what true effects he would have on the people whose lives he was disturbing. He must have realized in quiet hours alone that the path he had forged would later bring death and destruction to the Indians who had welcomed him into their villages. Then again, we reason, perhaps he didn't care. I wondered if he was cursed by the Indians, shot with thin medicine arrows that would conjure bad dreams, prophecies that would awaken in him when he returned home. His journey of discovery did advance information, but not for Indians. As the original captain of the Corps, he was a spearhead of manifest destiny. Um, and I had something really curious happen, and I, I love the way that, um, and I, I believe that uh, the earth itself speaks to us, trees speak to us, and more and more um, science is proving that, uh, that trees are interconnected and that they do communicate, and that there's this web of communication throughout the earth and we can feel it. And I had this curious um, sort of like really um, amazing thing that I actually put in the Lost Journals of Sacagawea as well. But it appears here and this um, happened. Um, and it's one of those, I, it's just one of those fantastic sort of things that happen in your life that you witness something that you say, <laughs> that you say this, this cannot have happened or this cannot be happening. Um, and here it is. Uh, and this was like the last night of our, our river, you know, our, our river float and being up, you know, on the Missouri. I mean, it was just this beautiful, incredible time that I had to sort of commune with nature and to commune with others. I looked up the river. I have always been a person who enjoys the wonders of nature, the thrill of Earth's devastating power. I've witnessed a wind shear buzz down one giant ponderosa after the other in my own backyard. I've seen a lightning strike explode into fire before me. But as I stood by the Missouri that night, my knees trembled at the sight coming toward me. I have told this story many times. Perhaps over the years I have embellished the tale, but I don't think so. As lightning blazed up the riverbanks, I saw flaring fireball seconds on the water, silt dust clouds exploding in dazzling brief light. I have heard that a man was once able to change the direction of wind by placing small flags on his walkway. I have seen the ghosts of the long ago dead hovering at my windows. I have seen an owl swoop on a bat on a full moon night, have heard the crunch of bat bones in his jaws. I have ducked beneath a thin blanket in the back of my dad's El Camino while an owl has passed over me, his wingspan covering every inch of me and the pickup bed. I have heard the gargled voices of a man near death. I have seen my dead husband walking on the streets of New York, but I have never witnessed anything like what I saw that night. 
It was not lightning. I saw a giant man electrified. Each spear of lightning was he, illuminated. Every electrified hit was he, stepping closer. He lit the river and the pale cliffs like daylight. As I made my way to the lean-to, I turned to see him pass by the camp and move onward down the Missouri. If the old stories are true and prophecy exists for the people, nature shows us what the future holds. And um, so that was just a, uh, um, an incredible um, evening and the whole journey, I think it was uh, lasted for a week that we were on the Missouri. And I never thought that um, from this experience and after I had written this um, essay that I would ever be um, called in to, to uh, write about uh, anything about the expedition again. And uh, I was thrilled actually that ma'am wanted me to tr give it a shot. And, um, the opportunity to share your stories, um, the opportunity to sit with someone else's stories and consider history in a deeper way um, has been unimaginable for me. Uh, that journey is something, um, you know, I heard in graduate school that you have to question and you have to, um, you have to look deeply into things and you have to be, you know, critical minded about texts that you're reading, but as I was reading the journals of Lewis and Clark and Gass and Ordway and Whitehouse, as I was looking through those texts and just sitting with them, Sacagawea just appeared between uh, the lines of those manuscripts, and I began to wonder, you know, when Sergeant Ordway in, 18, in November of 1805 was at Mandan Camp, and uh, he had taken a wife for a dark night, and the husband of this wife was upset, and the woman ended up being stabbed brutally three times and beaten. And she ended up at the interpreter's campfire, and there's just a brief note in some of the, in some of the journals, but not all, that uh, it was Jesson made and his wife, but later it says, it was Sacagawea, but it occurred to me, like right off, that it was Sacagawea who was tending to this woman. And so that, um, and so that story uh, kept coming around to me, like what happened to the women? What, what was it like to be a Native woman? And, and you're at the precipice of like a changing world and you're witnessing something that, you know, many tribes like Sacagawea's um, people had not even seen a white man before. And so this journey, like these, all of these traders coming into the, the fort and all these different tribes, uh, including, including um, the Apisaluki, the, you know, all these different tribes that were even enemies to her people were coming into this, you know, Mandan and trading and, you know, all the, the flurry in these camps. And, you know, it just made me um, really question some things. And, um, and it's so, and, and recently um, I was asked to uh, deliver the Stegner Lecture at Montana State University. So I've been working on, um, you know, going back over the journals and looking at them again, and I just, again, I'm like drawn into uh, these journals and what they're saying. And if you look at the narrative arc of these journals, um, these men are, you can see how frightened they are at times or how, how much bravado there is. And Lewis is saying, uh, likes to say, well, these people are superstitious and, and these, uh, these animals, they're talking about grizzlies, are not that big and look at what we can do. And they're kind of, they actually say that, they kind of pump themselves up and then a few pages later, they're, they, uh, they approach a, gr a grizzly is running at them, they shoot five rounds into its lungs, 10 overall, and you think about these big, you know, um, bullets or, you know, these blood lent, lead in their, 
and this bear does not stop. And, uh, and then finally he says, I believe the place might be enchanted. There's some enchantment here. But over the, over the course, you can see there, even though they don't want to write about this, they're, you know, they're on a military recog reconnaissance, actually. They, they don't want to write about the stories, but they find them, you find these stories um, all throughout the journal. And just before they arrive at Mandan, um, where they're near Vernon, South Dakota, and there's this, um, it sounds like Devil's Tower, but it's not. Um, there's this precipice that they see, and the uh, Rickara tell them, do not go up there. Like, don't even try it. Don't go up there because the little people live up there, and they will shoot arrows into you, <laughs> like, and the arrows will, you'll die a terrible death. Like, just don't. And what's curious is that years later, there's very few of the Corps that didn't die kind of a, you know, mysterious or die early or, you know, so these stories came true. But if you began to look at this magnificent story, I mean, it truly is. Uh, some of the, the things that they went through, the kinds of uh, stamina that they must have had. I mean, they were clipping the toes off, uh, uh, you know, this young boy at one point, Clark was, you know, snipping his toes off um, because of the, it, because the weather was so cold. And these, and you see these um, Mandan and the, the Hidatsa men and their, um, they show their own bravado and they come out with like, you know, just a breech cloth or some naked and they're on the river and they get on these floats. Like it is 20 below zero. Remember, we just, we just went through 20 below zero. Now imagine um, you're out, the river is like, like once that river breaks up and it's still cold, it's icy cold, and these men are jumping on these blocks of ice that are floating in the river and they're maintaining their balance and they're in breech cloths. And they jump from something that is smaller than this podium top, like two feet, and they in the river and they're able to hold, maintain their belts. And I thought, wow, they are really showing off too, you know, <laughs> what they can do. And, uh, you know, just, just the kind of amazing things if you, if you sit with history. So it's made me think about, um, you know, all the things. Like, I, I, I'm just so curious why this hasn't happened before. Like, why somebody didn't look at Sacagawea and say, you know, how old were you exactly? Like, if, if Clark, Clark's fiance was 12 years old when he left Virginia, he would have had to court her when she was 10 or 11, his fiance. When he gets to, um, to Mandan camp, sometimes they refer to Sacagawea as being young. If she's, and she was, they say she's 16 years old, but she's six months pregnant. Uh, and they say that, but they, I was thinking, where do these historians get this information <laughs> anyway? Because 1788 is the date that they give for Sacagawea, was born in 1788, but there's no, there's no evidence of that. That's just a, that's just something that they pluck to make the uh, historians, not Lewis and Clark, but um, that they say, including Ambrose, that they use that, that date because it makes Sacagawea acceptable. So she is around 15 or 16, which is still a little dicey, uh, but it makes it acceptable. But if she's younger than that, and if you begin to read the journals really carefully, I think she was really young. I think she was maybe 12 years old. If you, read the, if you read that journals and what she went through, she is by herself. She's a woman carrying a baby. I've never had a child, but I listen to all my friends <laughs> and all the women who've had children. You imagine carrying a baby, you have to nurse a baby. You're traveling with 32 men. You have to sleep in the same lodge that Lewis and Clark and sleeps in Sergeant Gass, Lewis and Clark and uh, Charbonneau. And Ambrose, I think, does question this, like, why is that? Um, there are some historians that say it's because Charbonneau was trying to sell Sacagawea to 
to the men in the court. And it's reasonable to think that because at every camp they stop, even though wives are offered to them, they gladly accept and Lewis and Clark have to kind of pull them back sometimes from their randiness and their enthusiasm. So imagine being a young girl, an enslaved young girl, <coughs> with a man who we know hits her at least once, but if you have been a woman who has been hit by a man, they hit you many times, and Clark wouldn't be writing about, or Lewis would not be writing about the many times that she was abused over that trip. There's something that's really interesting, I think, the Hadatsas and, um, you know, they may very well be true that Sacagawea uh, was, was a Hadatsa, was taken by the Shoshone. But the Lemha Shoshone, of course, claimed Sacagawea was their own. The thing that I think is most imp important to remember is that Lewis and Clark were not creative men necessarily. They weren't like writing stories or embellishing. Um, and when uh, they actually said how Lewis at one point talks about how Sacagawea did not show any emotion, like she didn't really show one, we couldn't tell if she cared one way or the other that she was, she had been um, brutally taken by the Hadatsa. She doesn't express that. But when she got home, like every time I think of this, when she got home, when she saw the Lem Shoshone coming toward her, she could not stop crying. Like she sucked her fingers and, you know, to, I think to try to stop herself from crying and she was just overcome. And when she sees, like she's trying to do, she's trying to help Lewis and Clark with, um, with gathering their, their horses. So she's sitting in a lodge with Camille Waite and, and then she realizes he's her brother and she turns and she is just so sobs and he's like embraces her and then uh, trying to get on with business and he's like, she is just overcome. But nowhere in the journals does it ever reveal that Sacagawea before this time expressed any emotion. So she had to keep herself buttoned up and quiet and how fearful she must have been during that journey and what that must have been like to finally come home, to come home and see like these women coming toward her and embracing her that she knew. I mean, the story is so powerful and we just get like just a pinhole <laughs> glimpse of that. But then we, you know, if we begin to look at those journals and, you know, we can see Clark's jealousies no, oh, he's, he's, he's so jealous of York. You know, he tells him he's fat at one point and needs to lose weight. I mean, <laughs> because the people come out and they're like, look around, those men in their big shining uniform, you know, with their beautiful uniforms, their brass shining buttons, and they're just like, look right around them and their guns <laughs> blazing, and they want to see, they want to touch York. They want to be like this magnificent man. You know, they just can't believe, and they don't care about Lewis and Clark, how we've seen you before, but, you know, no one has seen anything like you are. Um, so, I guess in, um, in closing, I'd like to take some uh, questions. Uh, I just want to say, um, if any of you, I, I've experienced this before, but people who come and, you know, to, to a uh, museum and, uh, come to places where there's information or history um, are, are usually people who like to write themselves, who, who like to, to dabble in history and to look at things and to observe and to connect. And um, I'm gonna tell you uh, what a journey it is. You know, and it was one that you know, I was asked to take that I kinda, I felt like I kinda kicked in a little bit and, I didn't necessarily scream, but it wasn't something that I wanted to do. And if someone like me, who's not you know, that into Western history, can be drawn up into a story 
Like what a magnificent journey it is. And I ask that all of you, because everybody has a different way of seeing the world, of looking at a, a piece of evidence, at looking at primary documents, everybody sees the world in a different way. And so when you and each of you sit with that, you know, if you choose to sit with the Lewis and Clark journals and you begin to read them, you're gonna see something that you've never seen before. And it's just, I think it requires just a tremendous amount of love, really, and patience to sit with those, to sit with history, and to see something no one has seen before. And Lewis and Clark are not done. Sacagawea is not over. There's so many things to discover in that, in their journals. And I, and I really um, encourage you all uh, to take that journey, to look. It, like some people have said, oh, it's so dry in the journals, you know, because they list all of these things. Um, but I, I think if you, um, what is the word I want? Release yourself, surrender um, to history, and begin to look at it. Um, and, and you look at it in two ways. One, historically at the time and how, they, how the people were, and you look at it as a contemporary person looking back through history, you know, presentism. You look at things in that way. But um, so I'll close with saying that. Please, uh, please take a deeper look at history. You'll be astonished and amazed at what you see. Thank you. Hover over here. So I'm sure that we are going to have lots of questions. I know I have questions, so if you don't, don't worry. We're going to take up some time here. Um, I'm going to ask Galen to monitor the chat for questions. As people ask, if you wouldn't mind repeating the question so the people on Zoom can hear it. Okay. Okay. And right here. <laughs> Thank you for giving her a voice. <laughs> I don't recall anything else that was ever given her a voice. I found this book challenging. You're, I want to ask you a writing question. I love the way um, it becomes poetry in different places, that you use a lighter typeface in different places. As an oral historian, we used to talk about how do you transfer a voice into print and words in a way that carries the emotion and other things with it into this kind of print. And you have done that. Could you talk about the evolution and how and why you made decisions to put certain things in more of a poetic form. I mean, this is not a book you zip through. You have to sit with it. You have to read it carefully as though you were reading poetry. You are hearing someone's voice in that way. It's very unique, I think. Could you talk about how you, how you did that and how you did that? Um, I'm going to boil this question down. <laughs> um, and the question is, like, um, Really, how did I write this? How did I write the last journals of Sacagawea in effect? Uh, Sacagawea's voice and um, the experience, I think, is that. Um, gosh, you know, some, <laughs> so, sometimes things that I, I hate saying this because I, I think it's I, I'm of two minds of it. Um, I didn't realize how, how much time since 1991 was it? Since um, I have been thinking about Lewis and Clark, I've been carrying the story with me. So, I, I think that journey that I made along the Missouri River years ago that I didn't even realize um, the kind of impact that it had on me that I, years later I would write uh, the Lost Journals or I'd, I'd have little bits and pieces with me. When I sat down to write it, it was, like I said, um, it took me 30 minutes to write the original book. Um, it took me, I was given six months to write um, the Lost Journals, and I had to take seven months. And not because I don't think I could have written it, but I just don't have a place to write. Like I had to, I was writing through the Sweet 16, like I was sitting on the couch, because I just don't have really a dedicated writing place. Um, but how I came to that, I think um, I began to understand, um, looking back, uh, and listening to my elders that, and if you listen to any of the, of your own people, you think about old stories, or if, if you love a nature walk, 
Um, everything tells a story, like the way in which the wind blows through the trees, the sound that a creek will make when it rushes over, when it's trying to move a boulder out of the way, you know, when things like that, just the sound of life around you. Um, you can even understand when you're sitting next to somebody and they don't speak, but they're disgruntled, and they're <clears throat> their, their body language and their movements, and um, the way that things sound. I was thinking there's some words that I, I had to make up because I, I didn't see them in the language, I didn't hear them, and one was jickle, 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 jickle. You know, when you take a seed pod and you shake it, it goes jickle, jickle, jickle. You know, so it makes that kind of sound. And I thought, I'm just going to listen to nature, and I'm also going to try to imagine what it was like 300 years ago. Try to imagine what it was like before we even saw a, a white person. What it was like to hear language and to listen to bears <clears throat> And know that, you know, if you've ever been around a bear, you'll have you ever done this and said, hey, look, a bear? And your partner will turn and look, and then it's gone? Because it's just stepped right back into the brush and disappears. I think language is like that. It's, it's, it moves. It changes. It reflects light. It refracts light. And um, the choices that I made in this book, um, in this manuscript, in this story, we're trying to honor the beauty that the people held, the things that they held dear, things that they loved, and things like liver shine um, was beautiful. You know, warm liver, you know, taken from, still a delicacy, taken directly out of a deer after it's been, you know, after it's been killed and slaughtered. It's like just that, the blood taste of that was something they, you know, many tribes really enjoy that and still do. You know, how do you, how do you make people understand that, um, you know, they couldn't even at the time, the traders and Lewis and Clark, the explorers, could not understand why these people, like the, the man dance, when the buffalo would fall into the river and they'd float and then begin to blow it up and the gases were coming off. And can you imagine what that smelled like? The gases were coming off those, those buffalo and, uh, that the flesh itself was bottled green. They, they describe it like that. And, uh, and they soft. And the mandans and the dogs were like, here it comes. They waited for it. They were celebrating uh, these bloated buffaloes coming by, you know, the hundreds, you know, having fallen through the river because they could eat, because it was a simple way to eat and probably provide a lot of nutrients. And they loved the taste. They loved the smell. They enjoyed it. They reveled in it. And I thought, that's how you have to see the world. That's, that's what you have to sit with and bring to others. So I think when you're writing, you have to kind of cut off the contemporary side of you and begin to see things. As far as the poetic voice goes in the story, there's places where the story is, um, seems uh, like there's places where there's stories being told within the story. And those, and some of them are so difficult, I think, such a difficult and ugly journey. Um, violence against women, uh, violence against others, you know, just uh, kind of a grubby, um, grimy kind of uh, terrible violence that I, that I use, kind of broke up the line. I shattered, I don't consider myself a poet, I just shattered the line because I felt like I couldn't include too much. Like, the eye has to rest, the heart has to rest. And even when we're processing our own grief and our own terrible, our vi if we've ever experienced violence, we don't take it on full force or it's so traumatizing to us. So I break those lines, I shatter them so that you as a reader don't have to sit fully with that but can take it in kind of brief glimpses. Um, the faded prose in the story is um, things that Sacagawea, I feel, that she feels are sacred things, and she can't say them. So, you know, the names of the dead, certain things are, 
th like certain animals um, are things that she won't say. Sometimes the land itself is, she recognizes, has a certain power that she won't say that. So it becomes faded. So it would be something that she whispers or says only to herself. So, um, so the manuscript shows that kind of, the, the language in the lost journal shows those things. So I'm sorry, that's a really long answer to that question, but it's kind of a long process to get into this character. Anybody else in the room have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I wanted to ask about the book talks about the difference in men's stories and women's stories. Even uh, that uh, Secretary's mother tells her that the men are going to tell these stories differently. Can, is that, uh, does that come from an experience of yours? Or how did, it, it just was such an important thing to understand that men and women focus on different things and tell different stories. And where did that come from for you? Um, thank you. That's a really great question. Do I need to repeat that? Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Maybe you can come up here and say, but repeat this question. Um, it's kind of the the, way, the different ways that um, men and women tell stories, and why did I choose to um, to relate those stories? And is that from a personal experience, or is that maybe even from a cultural experience? Um, and I would say. Uh, I would say it's really interesting because, um, you know, when I went to the University of Washington, I, I studied, um, you know, di all different kinds of, uh, you know, through anthropolo anthropological studies and Native American studies and the ways in which um, different tribes related to different things. So um, when I was thinking about this story, I thought about... Um, the ways in which you know anthropologists have long told us that we have roles, and that there's women's roles and there's men's roles, and there's them, but you know that's not really, <laughs> that's not sacrosanct or really true. It's um, in my experience and within my own tribe and um, in my close contact with the Kootenays, women can be, and men, can be who they are called to be. So these roles, like there, there's, you know, there there are roles that women do uh, traditionally, I guess, but they're not forced into those roles. If women, a woman can be uh, a warrior. Um, a woman can be a care a caretaker. Uh, a man can be a warrior or a caretaker. Like these, there's more fluidity in the roles that are given, and I think there's kind of um, those old anthropological texts will impose a certain gender on uh, gender roles on on things. Um, given that, I think uh, women, and not just native women, uh, but women that I have, you know, women I know, um, we tell stories in order to survive. We tell each other, don't go down that street. Don't go near that man. That man is dangerous. I remember my mother saying, don't be alone in this room with that person. Um, if he comes over, you need to tell me. Um, anytime you face violence, like anytime women, and, and this is like from a women's perspective, um, and my father was telling, you know, my brothers, like, this is your responsibility as a man. Like, you need to be watchful so that your sister isn't harmed in any way. So you need to be watchful around your friends. You need to, you know, you need to do certain things. Um, I'm not sure whether my brother always heeded that. I would, remember when I was a kid, I used to play with my brother and all of his friends, and you know, it was kind of a tomboy, but you know, I think we are given certain, we're told things like um, people tell the stories they need to tell in order to survive. In the Lost Journals of Sacagawea, I thought about the experience of women who their culture was changing and shifting because they were being um, exposed to you know, a lot of um, 
you know, there's, there's a difference between physical violence and even emotional or psychological violence. And the kinds of things that they were encountering were changing and shifting the ways in which men behaved um, and the ways in which women behaved toward them. So, and you can see it in the journals as the, uh, you know, the, the interaction between the traders and, and uh, the native men and how that kind of spawned a certain kind of violence. Uh, ceremonies were desecrated. Um, there was invitations and, to come into ceremonies that uh, I don't believe that certain, that it should have been opened because these men did not, like Lewis and Clark and their men were laughing at them, saying these are just superstitious kind of nonsense, but they were really powerful ceremonies. But when you, when you open the door uh, to that kind of, um, to greed and to desire, you change that whole narrative. So that's what I think. Um, so that's why I believe that, you know, especially at Mandan Camp, there were things that were stirring up. Whole, the culture was being um, dr dramatically changed and modified and commodified. And so, you know, with all of those things, um, with all of those things that women had to endure, their stories also changed. Question mm -hmm. In listening to you, it sounds as though a lot of your personal experiences may have been, may have evolved through the times and through the writing. How do you separate yourself from those that are the most painful? Oh, how do I separate myself from, uh, you mean the places in the, in the book what, that I wrote about? I really touch home. Oh. Um, so how do I write about the places uh, that really touch home? Like, how do I dress that as a writer? Um, God, this is going to sound horrible. I'm going to sound like a bad person, but gleefully, I like, when I was going, like, I think there's this wonderful thing that happens as a writer. Um, you're trying to conjure up this moment, right? So you're trying to conjure up something so that somebody else can see what it is that you're seeing in your mind. So we all see, you know, we all have that major motion picture moving through our head, don't we? But we also, we don't always have the, the soundtrack that's perfect for it. Um, but when you do, when all of a sudden those words start clicking and the soundtrack is like, oh, this is the music, this is the voice of this piece. And when you find that, there's something, it's almost like being electrified by the universe, I, I feel. And when I was writing this, I, I just felt alive and full of power. And, you know, I was, you know, in control of this narrative. I was writing through these traumatic events. But you know what's weird? After I finished it, and then I was invited to Lauren Korn, The Right Question, and she asked me a question. I started reading it, and I felt so emotional. Um, I was like, uh, that, uh, that was surprising to me. And I thought, oh, this is such a powerful story. Not Sacagawea's story, it's such a powerful story. And these words bring it to the page so in ways that I didn't see at the time that I was writing. So I think as a writer, maybe for me anyway, I had to be blind to really, to what I was writing at the whole time being wide awake. It, it's two very different sort of, yeah to bifurcated ways of looking at a single thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Did you travel to or revisit any locations along the trail as part of your research? Um, you know what? I haven't, and not since the Missouri River trip. Um, you know, and I, I I bought all the books with the, you know, they have those gorgeous books of, you know, what Lewis and Clark saw on the trail. I mean, the photography and the cinematography and that is beautiful. I have been to Clatsop. Um, I haven't been to um, North Dakota. I haven't been to Mandan. I have one, I, I want to tell one experience that I think is really strange that happened to me. Um, I kept seeing this woman years ago. Um, I saw the woman. Uh, and she identified herself in my imagination as the woman who has always lived. And I saw her like 
at Mandan Camp, and she lived beyond the menstrual huts, and she lived in this kind of earth lodge. And uh, she wanted mirrors. She kept telling all the warriors, bring me mirrors, I want all the mirrors. And she'd put them on her, on her robe. And she was blind. So whenever th she would say, put them along the river so I can see what's going on there. And so she could see what was happening in the river. I thought, who is this? Why am I thinking of this? And who is this, the woman who has always lived? And so she shows up. Um, in the Lost Journals of Sacagawea, and she takes Sacagawea and says, oh, you know, come, come see, come look, I'll tell you stories. And Sacagawea says, who are you? And she says, I'm the woman who has always lived. I thought, I better look this up. Like, I better look it up. <laughs> Do you know that I came across, and, and somewhere deep in the recesses of, you know, I could have come across this years ago, but I found a book called Mandan Ceremonies, and I talked to a friend of mine who's Mandan, and she said, her name is the woman who never died, and she is a spirit. Um, she's a sacred star spirit, and she is one of our ancestors. Um, and I was like, uh, she, I said, well, she, likes, she doesn't like death in her name. Is, so she likes to be called, the, for me, she reveals herself as the woman who has always lived. And she goes, oh, she goes, um, I think she's speaking to you. Because I had like, whenever she appeared in this story, it just went like, it was the easiest thing to write. It was the most peaceful, easiest journey. And then when she said, do not let anyone tell you there is only one story. If there were only one story or one way of seeing things, all stories would die. And um, I thought, wait. <laughs> that just so I just wrote it down. Um, so I can't even remember the question, but uh, about how have I journeyed? Have I have I traveled? Have I seen um, have I seen the the lands that you know gone along the Lewis and Clark Trail? I guess um, bits and pieces here and there, but I think emotionally I have uh, traveled that road. Right. Yes. I don't know exactly how to ask this, but I'm, I'm struck by how young John Santa Julia was, you know, and and the young strength that she had. And I think I remember in the book that you addressed that a little bit about how she was raised and um, kind of how that's different from Lewis and Clark and what they brought. You know, with, with, what it was before the change, actually. Um, the question is, or it, it, and and couched a little bit in a statement, um, but how Sacagawea, um, how young she was, and how much traditional knowledge she had, she had, um, and how, you know, how how did she have that, or is that um, the difference between what she was. Doing. Oh, and the difference between the maybe the white men in the core. Um, well, it's it's just evident throughout um, the the journals, uh, the kinds of uh, his like cultural knowledge that Sacagawea had, and uh, just living off the earth, like off the land. She knew, um, which I think there's a really curious thing. They call them uh, mouse beans. Um, Lewis and Clark call them artichokes, like small artichokes, but they're actually like this um, this root that is like the mice will, will, like a small potato kind of thing that the mice will get, and they have their little caches, and she knew where to find those, you know, and I'm sure had to make amends to the mice, had to offer them something for these, for these uh, really nutritious um, beans, I guess, or roots. So um, I think, you know, I think when you consider that uh, you're taken from, and this is this, I'm going with the traditional story you're, that we hear in history books, that she was Lemai Shoshone, that she was taken from um, the village at Three Forks in, um, and not the Hadatsa story that claims that she was theirs. It's a whole other narrative. Um, 
But any woman who is taken by force and you're young and has to survive, in order to survive and make it, you have to rely on all of the teachings that you have. And you have to, you know, just even her being really quiet, like not revealing her language or that she, I believe that she, she just held on to her traditional, what she was taught and what her father and mother and family and elders had taught her so that she could make it through. Like she could figure out a way to um, live uh, without Lewis, without anybody. She could have been out there by herself. And, and I believe that, you know, tradition, you know, our elders will teach us this is the way you survive. And when I think about that, I'm old, you know, I'm in this century, but what it must have been like for her people to teach her, you know, 200 years ago, what that was like, um, how much knowledge she had to have known just to, just to live. I mean, she could go in a river and figure out where the, where the roots were, where the potatoes were, so she could feed herself. She knew where all the nutritious seeds were, where the onions were. Um, she could gather seeds from the trees. She knew which bark was, you know, to eat. I mean, just this wealth of knowledge that she came with that she had to hold really tight to, tightly to, even and even more so because she was an abducted woman, she was an enslaved woman and she had to keep her baby and herself alive. So she had to rely on all this knowledge. And it's no different than any, any one of you. If you were put in this situation, something kicks in and you have to fire up you know, everything in order to survive. And if you don't, you don't survive. And you know, people didn't survive, many didn't. But she was an extraordinary human being. Any other questions? Yep. We have a group. I mean, here at Travis Wrestling Meet, periodically we have for years and dig into different questions we have about the expedition of Lewis and Clark, etc. And we just met a couple of days ago, and one of the subjects we talked about was the fact that Sacagawea, when she came with them over the top of Bitterroots down into Ross's Hole, etc., um, I was wondering what the Salish thought of her being with them. And I have been unable to find anything to ever make reference to it. And I would have thought that there would have been things passed down from person to person over the time that might have addressed the fact that um, she was with them. You know, I think they were, uh, I think the Salish, and I can't you know, speak for my tribe, but, um, I think like all tribes just believed that they were coming in peace because they had a native woman with them. So native woman and a child. So I think that was it. But what's interesting to me is the Salish um, long had a history with Sacagawea. And I spoke with Johnny R. Lee, who's our tribal elder, and he said, oh, well, there are stories about Sacagawea. You know, we saw her um, when she was 40 years old, she was at, in St. Louis, like she did, she did live past what Clark said, um, that, tw that she died at the age of 23 from Putin's fever at Fort Manuel. He said, no, that, that's not true. Um, so I think that kind of history um, sort of prevents that kind of, uh, what you're saying, like what they would have thought of her because there was a longer history with her. So. Um, they be know her story and you know came to know her story so I'm not sure what they thought when they first saw her or what they must have I mean it must have been amazing to them to yeah yeah well she's not she isn't really isn't that you know you think about the ghost of Sacagawea how she's always she's always present always has to be hyper vigilant and uh, yet very, very little. I think over the course of what, how many pages is, it's how many volumes, she's mentioned like 22 times. And, and many of those times, uh, they don't really mention her. They have to, historians have to pluck through and say, oh, that was her. So I, yeah, that's a really good question. I'll ask it the next time I, and congratulations. Um, he was saying that, uh, they, how many years has it been? that you've been meeting? Oh, well, I've been here for 20 years, and it's been, <laughs> how about, when did we start? 
I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question, but the question um, concerned, uh, they had, uh, his group has been meeting here at Traveler's Lodge and in this area for 20 years and studying. Oh, a good dozen years. Oh, oh, a good dozen years as a group. And they, um, they wanted to know if the Salish had any kind of idea about Sacagawea or ever talked about her um, or that I've heard any like stories from, you know, my tribe, the Salish, if they, the Bitterroot Salish, if they had, you know, spoken about her in any way or what they thought of her at the time when they saw her. I don't know, don't you think that would have been just, the whole thing is astonishing to me, the, you know, when they arrived. But it, I'm sure you've studied the Bitterroot, but there are some really curious, curious things that happened. Um, along that whole, you know, especially when they got to the bitter roots and they had old Toby with them, or Toby, and he started, he and his son, which I, I'd like to find out what happened with him, but he started running, like he brought the horses, he, he didn't get his payment, he didn't receive payment from Lewis and Clark, and they were like, what the heck? He and his son just took off running as fast as they could. And they saw them later, like they just saw they, something spooked them and they ran like a shot out of there, like just, just, just near here. And I was like, I wonder what they saw. There's some things that may indicate that something uh, supernatural was going on there. Uh, I always look for Bigfoot. Yeah. And then I, <laughs> I always look for Bigfoot in the in the journals, and I think they do talk about it too. All right. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. You got to turn on. Hi, everybody. So we do have some copies of the Lost Journals of Sacagawea for sale, and Deborah has agreed to stay and sign books. There are like two copies of Permared, which if you have not read it, I know this is, we're sort of Lewis and Clarky around here, <laughs> but Permared broke me. It's such a beautiful novel. So I highly encourage reading it as well. Um, and thanks again so much. I wanted to make a reminder. Shirley Trahan is our speaker for next week. She is an elder from the Salish Kellis Bay Culture Committee. She will be joining us only on Zoom. So um, we will broadcast it on the screen here if that's the easiest way for you to participate. Um, but if you can join from Zoom at home. Um, that is just as comfortable for us, too. So, um, And I know that I have one person who has had a little trouble with Zoom. If you have had trouble with Zoom, feel free to call me here, and we'll do a trial run. We'll test it out before the program on Saturday. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day.